study the 24th and the 25th verse. All right. So the 24th verse says the fire, light, daytime, the bright fortnight, the six months of the northern part of the sun, these departing the knowers of Brahman go to Brahman. So the 24th verse gives us the path of the sun. It talks of the spiritual seekers who perform the, the highest of spiritual paths, take to the path of no return. So they are the seekers who seek Brahman as a result of performing actions which are of unselfish along with selfless actions. They practice what is known as Upasana. So when you practice Upasana, they go into a realm of Brahmaloka. Brahmaloka is a realm of experience where you exhaust your meritorious punya because of your meritorious deeds, and then they are they enjoy the discourse of Lord Brahma and they get to Brahman. So these are the people who perform unselfish or selfless actions. They follow the path of the sun known as Devayana. Verse 25, he talks of the path of the moon known as Pitriyana. You can consider it a path of darkness. He says the smoke night time, dark fortnight, the six months of the southern path of the sun here obtaining the lunar light, the yogi returns. So here, the path of the, the moon, the path of fortnight, path of darkness indicates ignorance. Here, they go through the path without upasana. Sir, upasana, the word Sanskrit word upasana, upasana. You sit close asana to a teacher with the only objective to gain the perception of the guru, to gain that insight, to gain the wisdom. So, sitting is an introverted activity. Therefore, but when you are using your limbs, like you are on the run, it is considered to be an extroverted activity. Therefore, even speech is considered to be an extraordinary action because speech is also an organ of action. Feet, limbs are organs of action. So when you are seated, it is introversion, you're going inward. So one who performs or leads a life without upasana leads a What kind of life they would lead? They are seeking a fruit, Palakama. They always want, there is a desire, there is a fruit intended to their actions. It is swartha, selfish. And all of that is because there is no upasana. Means when there is no higher knowledge, when there is no higher goal, your actions invariably become selfish and self-centered. So these people, the path of darkness, they may even take to religion with only interest to satisfy their personal hidden appetite. There's hidden agenda. 
something that they want to seek for themselves. So this is called the path of darkness, the path of the moon, or you can also say the path of the sun without Upasana. The path of sun without Upasana is the path of the moon, the path of darkness, the path of ignorance. And these people, the yogi returns. He keeps coming back to the cycle of birth and death. He comes back to the cycle. Ashama, did you get it? The path of the moon, the path of ignorance, the path of darkness. Gee. You noted it? Look. Yes, yes. Huh? Yes, yes. Path of darkness, path of the moon, the yogi returns to the cycle of birth and death. The yogi returns to the cycle of birth and death, the path of ignorance, or the path where there is no upasana, means when your actions are not injected with the knowledge of Brahman, it's a cycle of return. Okay? Let's move on. 26 minutes. Shukla Krishna Gati Hete Jagata Shashvate Mate Ekaya Yapyana Vrittim Anyaya Vartate Punaha Shukla Krishna Gati Hete Jagata Shashvate Mate Ekaya Yapyana Vrittim Anyaya the, the chat box can be narrowed a little bit. From the left to the right. Ah, it's okay. For a moment you can leave it. Can remove it. Those bright and dark parts of the world are verily deemed eternal. Shashvate Mate. Shashvatam means eternal. By the one man goes not to return, but by the other he returns again. One fellow goes there, he never comes back. Other fellow keeps going and coming back. Again and again, again and again. Small intellect, alpha buddhi. This fellow will make N number of trips, go then come back, return, return. One fellow goes there, not to return. If there's a slight confusion in the construction, it doesn't matter, this is what it means. So it is very clear what it is. Those with the path of the brightness, they will go not to return. The path of the dark path, keep subjected back to the path of return. Now, what's interesting is here, he says, both these parts are verily deemed eternal. One who gets to the path of no return, he hates Brahman. And one of the descriptions of Brahman is eternal. Isn't it? There is no birth, there is no death, it's eternity. But those who return also is eternal. How is it? Sorry? Sir, Ridigaru, just pass the microphone to them. Just pass it, sir. They'll, they'll show you. It is unending cycle of birth and death. It's so keep on coming back, coming back eternally. So even the path of return also seems to be eternal because this cycle of birth and death also is a continuous cycle. Now, if you remember earlier, we had studied that one day of Brahma is what? To alas, is 4.32 billion human years. Another to alas is another 4.32 billion human years. So, one day of Lord Brahma 
is 8.64 billion human years multiply by that by 30 and 12 and 100 years that's a lifespan of brahma coming going through that cycle again and again because only brahma loka is only a, a meritorious experience where you go through a superlative state that's all but subject through the cycle of birth and death again and again, he says it's eternal. So that's the only way we must understand. Both these worlds are deemed eternal. But through knowledge, you come to a state of no return. With ignorance, you will be subject to return. Now, why we all return, we understand. The path of return is because of the desires and the vasanas. There is only return because of the desires and vasanas. As long as you have vasanas, you will be born again. Now, temporarily, we also go through a similar phase of experience at the relative level. Our desires also go through what is known as a cold stricken snake. There is an analogy compared to a state of a, a cold stricken snake. Cold stricken. Cold stricken and if uh, in the Himalayas, Swami Ramatita talks of the snakes in the icy mountains with extreme temperature, minus 20, minus 30 in the temperature, the snakes get cold stricken. They, they freeze. The way they are they freeze and it, they apparently dead, lifeless. Apparently dead. They don't die. So they go into kind of a cold storage. Hibernation is where you, you sort of consciously go. Here it is because of the induced uh, temperature, you almost get into that sort of a hibernation state. So they are seemingly dead. Literally kids go and start playing with them and things. But come the sunshine and once the temperature starts warming, they get back to life and start hissing. That's what a snake does. It hisses. It has its poison. It's dangerous. So Swami Ramatita talks of a desire is akin to a cold stricken snake. So you never know for sure whether desire has gone into that state of a cold storage or has it been completely eradicated from my system. So the spiritual dirt, the mala, the spiritual dirt is the desires. Two questions, sir. Oh my God. At a short, Ramji is asking two questions. No, the yes, first sir. one is, why does he call him a yogi who keeps coming back? Why does he call him a yogi? Because even an ordinary person will keep coming back. Not necessarily a yogi. That is question number one, sir. Where does he say, uh, which verse? 25. Because 26, he doesn't say that. 25. Ah. The yogi returns. Okay. So... I'm just trying to understand that uh, everybody will return. If, if they are not they are in that path of ignorance, everybody will come back, not just the yogi. Why does he call him a yogi? Because a yogi is a more evolved person than a... Unless you have some other interpretation of the word yogi. But, uh, so that's what I wanted to know. My second question also will finish so that you can... <laughs> My second question is that, again... Uh, deemed eternal. Eternal is something uh, the first one I understand because you go there, you don't come back. So that is the eternal place for you. But in the place where you are going and coming back, although you are in a cycle of going and coming, you have an opportunity to go to the first uh, this thing. That means you have an opportunity to uh, to reach the Brahman. If you make first, an effort, if you make first, an effort. The first, uh, first, first one has reached Brahman, so yes. there is no return. Yeah. So that is Correct. eternal. The second one, who is in that cycle of going and coming, he makes the right effort. He can, 
he will not come back. He will reach the Brahman and he will not come back. So, when such an opportunity is there, why do you call it eternal? Because that cycle can be broken. It is not a, it is not a permanent cycle. Whereas in the first one, it is permanent. You have reached a permanent place and you are not coming back. So I thought, the first one eternal, I understand. But the second one, eternal, I didn't understand. Oh, ah. I, I get it. Now, you, the reason you are calling, you are questioning, why is it called eternal? Because there is also the possibility of breaking that cycle. So that's why he said the second eternal is relatively eternal. It's relatively we have been going through an unending cycle of birth and death. That's why I said one birth. What is the life of Lord Brahma? He said it's what? 8.64 into so as one day. 100 years of that is lifespan of Brahma. And what is Brahma? Brahma is nothing but heavenly experience in the world for you and me. Just trying to tell you is quantifying the joy in Brahmaloka. Which means 8.64 billion years just goes like a flash. It's like, sir, if you're looking at something object that's flying in the sky, and if you look like this, if I were to just look like this in the sky, what does it mean? The object is going so fast that it, it just takes a fraction of a second for me to see from going from that end to the end where it disappears in the open sky. That is the speed of the object. But sometimes I may look at an aircraft at a, at a far distance. I can just keep glancing at it. It's low, it's, it is going very pretty fast. But still, I'm able to see the object going for, for a long period of time. I can see it's visible. So the, the quality of enjoyment in Brahmalaka is so high that time is not felt. Solidarity of time is not felt. So in that sense, relatively, if you break the cycle, then you become the first category. But majority of us are stuck in the second category, which is eternal, thanks to the blanket ignorance we all are caught up in. The ignorance in the form of desires. Desires and vasanas are making sure that the fuel ensures there is this continuous cycle of birth and death. Isn't it? Now, the, second, the first question, you said, why does he call a person who returns also a yogi. Because yogi is one who is seeking yoga. The fact that he's turned towards the self, towards the higher, he is practicing yoga. Other than that are those who are worshipping the world. These are the people not worshipping the world. They are genuinely seeking, but they are performing unselfish actions. They are performing. They have a fruit in mind. Karma Phala is there. They are unselfish. That they are creating some more unselfish karmas. They are creating unselfish desires. So they are subjected. They are also subjected to cycle of birth and death. But remember we said they go through a life of Indra Loka, Pitra Loka, Swarga Loka. But it is ignorance or darkness because you don't get to the Brahman. From that perspective, it is darkness. So there are people who seek the world selfish. There are people who seek the higher unselfish. There are people who seek Brahman selfless. Three types of Actions, selfish actions, unselfish actions, selfless actions. Selfless is the path of light. Unselfish is the path of moon. The path of the world is not spoken about. They are non-yogis. Non-yogis are those who are seeking something in the world for their gratification. They are not interested in the higher. That's the reason he calls them yogis. No, no. Selfless is 
Brahman. But when a person performs, sir, I, you remember the, the, the content we had put in a few weeks ago, were you there? Rajuma, can we access the old uh, content? See, remember we had spoken about one who performs selfless actions, only selfless actions, they go through the path known as Kaivalya Mukti, which is direct liberation. Hmm? Then the second category of people are those students who perform selfless plus unselfish. There's a blemish of desire, we said. So when there's a blemish of desire, you get to Brahma Loka, but because of selfless, you get Brahman, but there is known as Krama Mukti, liberation in stages. And then there are people who only perform unselfish work, they go through Pitru Loka, Svarga Loka, Indra Loka. And then there are people who worship the world. Four types of people we said, isn't it? Now you will get that. That is the one, yeah. That is the one. Page next to one, next one. Yeah. You, you change the angle for the others to see that. Thank you. Just a minute online, you will get the. Uh, so, the first category, Ramji, are the people who are pursuing the material. They are running behind acquisition enjoyment. They are in the world. So, they are not even considered. They are the non-yogis. So, just you want to add to that, you can call them as non-yogis. The first spiritual pursuit are those who are performing unselfish actions. These are the people who go through Pitruloka, etc. They exhaust the punya and they return to the cycle of birth and death. This is known as the pursuit of matter. Because they are not seeking Brahman. They are, what are they seeking? They are only seeking some unselfish punya. They are seeking a desire only. Unselfish desire they have, but they are not interested in Brahman. The cue is, the actions are noble, but is desired. That's the, you got to note this point here. It, oh, I can't. Okay. No, mind. I think this is the whole note. So this is, they are noble and desired in actions. That's the reason their cycle return to the cycle of birth and death. Okay. Now the second is where they perform selfless actions plus there is a blemish of desire plus they meditate. They go through the Krama Mukti. This is known as liberation in stages. So these people, they enjoy Brahma Loka, which is nothing but a, a superior heaven, and then they attain liberation. Liberation in stages. Could you use the mic one? On, on Jalman. Just press and hold until it becomes green. So these people also return back to society. No, no. These people, they attain liberation. Now, why they attain liberation is because they are performing selfless actions. Remember this. They perform selfless actions. 
they meditate, but they have a small blemish, it's a small stain of desires. Because of this, they go through another heavenly experience. But there, they listen to, they meditate and attain liberation. So this is also, they don't come back to the path of return. This is path of no return. They go and they reach, but it's only as if, my well, only difference between two and three is, this is a transit flight, this is a direct flight. Transit flight, you are spending 10 hours in a beautiful city. And because it's a long haul, they'll give you five-star stay. Uh, they'll give you carpet, red carpet treatment. You can go and see and enjoy the city, enjoy all the perks all on the airline. But you'll enjoy Brahma Loka and then from there you go to your destination, which is Brahman. No, but for that to go, that levish of desire has to go out. Then only we can go to that. So it will go when you spend that 10 hours in some Correct. other transit. Because of the blemish, you have to spend 10 hours. So your, your goal, reaching the goal or destination is delayed. But the masters are saying, even... A really serious student will not even waste 10 hours in transit. He is smart and he will reach the destination much faster. He is just a figurative wasting 10 hours. It could be one whole janma you wait enjoying Brahmaloka. Uh, having heavenly, you are born into the best of environments where you are delaying your enjoyment or uh, realization rather. But that happens, as you rightly said, because there is a blemish. What do, do, not to touch it. what do they do to come out of that blemish of desire in that transit? No, that, sir, the transit is a fruit of your action. You can't do anything to the fruit. You have to experience the fruit. See, if you have acted on the desire, there is a fruit, either favorable or unfavorable. But the unfavorable fruit only comes to the, the top category where you are the pursuit of material world. When you pursue the world, what you get is what is the outcome of pursuit of the world? Critical. Huh? Pain and pain and pain. Wombs of sorrow. The matter of time is all sorrow. Yeah? You have to realize it. But the next is so the first is this, second is selfless actions plus a blemish, the third is Kaivalya Mukti, where you only perform selfless actions without any blemish. There you live a life of total detachment. So it just gives you a, a perspective as to what are the different cadre of parts people take. Yes, sir. Guruji, this, uh, because of this blemish, uh, that he is going to Brahmaloka is a punishment for him because he's, uh, isn't it? Sir, it is, it is much inferior compared to Brahman. That is the reason it's a punishment. He's unable to... Not a punishment. Brahman. It is a, it's a delayed realization. You can't say a punishment. It is your, your, it becomes a, you are enjoying your day. Let's say you are, you, you are going to United States and then you go, you have, you're going by Dubai and everybody wants to go and shop and enjoy the, the material wealth of Dubai. Let's say you are, you, you are not in a hurry. It's not a business store. It's a luxury. It's like a holiday. You're going and you didn't mind spending 10 hours in Dubai enjoying. You say, yeah, why not? Why not? I enjoy Dubai without any cost of mine. It is all coming as a free to me. So you entertain that. You ask for it. No? Therefore you enjoy. Who is complaining? Nobody is complaining. Because you ask for it. No, you said no. Nothing doing. I have no time for any shopping of Rashgullahs. So Rashgullah was sent to her. She said, I am very busy, Guruji. 
sir you missed yesterday's class sir therefore rasgulla you are not going to get sir this is the price you pay for missing yesterday's class sir vasant amma i have a soft corner i'll give her for our group for you no 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 rasgulla ama <laughs> they are not interested in the transcend world they only want brahman so you follow sir shivaji the monu category so it is very rare to find a seeker who belongs to the third category very rare most of the spiritual so called spiritual seekers fall in the first category and the rarest of them fall in the second category the indeed the rarest and rarest of all fall in the third category where they will say i am not interested in anything that the world has to offer i am only interested in god we only want realization so that kind of just mind boggling even to be in that kind that kind of a minds total detachment total disinterest to the world staggering staggering but please we we know that exists that possibility exists okay sanjay following i am following i understand the three paths um i'm just thinking about this the selfless only path i'm just processing how as a relative journey if one attains brahma loka that will feel like the highest loka like how, how is one to know, is one even capable of knowing if they attain brahma loka what element of them is selfless they or self um the blemish of desire uh there's such a like a, a someone on a material pursuit can surely understand they can self they can introspect and see okay look there are desires in me um even the unselfish can see okay look maybe i'm doing these things with some desire for even though they're unselfish i'm doing it for something not selfless and then the selfless with a blemish of desire and selfless is that blemish of desire it can get to a stage where that blemish of desire is so minuscule how is one to even imagine or identify it because if they attain brahma loka that in my mind attaining brahma loka is one of the highest it's, it's by no means a punishment it's like a mass it's like a it's a high achievement so then what would even inspire them to say okay now let me seek something even higher than this from a relative standpoint so it's, it's maybe not just a question it's just something i'm still processing in my mind about these so paths and hmm. you know have you have you seen this uh, very famous indian program which is, in fact is actually copied from a uh, western uh uh program is something called as pawn vega crorepati yeah 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 absolutely good otherwise i'll have to talk to you of the source i think there was a yeah. program many years ago called the sale of the century in australia okay <clears throat> who wants to be a millionaire it's called yeah you want yeah. to become a millionaire okay hmm. now when somebody goes into that competition it's all about quiz and you're answering and things like that you know the game but everybody doesn't win the jackpot jackpot is let's say 10 million dollars i'm just throwing 10 million dollars is a jackpot but someone out there he will compromise for a luxury car which will come at 200000 dollars he can buy a, a beautiful mercedes a fellow at 200000 dollars he is taking that and quit quitting the game he doesn't want to go to he doesn't want to take a chance of even attempting to get to that 10 million but there are people who have their eyes set only on that goal i only want 10 million they all want to encash their 
points or their position or a luxurious villa. One and a half million dollars, you can luxurious villa. But he has worked hard for that. He'll take that and say, I'm, I'm happy. I don't want any further. I'm just living in a rented apartment in a single bedroom and I'm going to get a one and a half million dollar villa. Man, chalo. I'm quitting, sir. I'm not interested to play the game. He's content with that. But rare are those people who are interested only in that. They have no other interest except that. So they don't encash their sadhana. They don't encash their points for themselves. So if you are saying Brahma Loka is, let's say, at $8 million, that point, he knows. He can encash it or he can say, no, I want to go. I want to take the risk of getting to that. He will not compromise. So that that concept of wanting to get to the highest, not interest in anything other than that. But my, I suppose then in that context, the question is, one does that because they've been told the highest price is 10 million. But what if, the, what if they've just been told the highest price, we're not going to tell you what the highest price is, we're just going to tell you it's high. So they're going to keep going, keep going, and they might think that they've reached it. Who is going to tell them that, okay, okay, look, 10 million is the highest. That's it. You finished. You've won the game. The Shastras are roaring the truth to you. Okay. Okay. Are they not roaring the truth to you again mm -hmm. and again? They're saying Brahman is the highest. In fact, the ninth chapter, I doubt we'll get into today, but the ninth chapter, you know, what's the title of the ninth chapter? The ninth chapter is titled as the Yoga of Royal Knowledge and Royal Secret. It is pure royalty, my dear. As a Britisher, you will understand what royalty is, isn't it? I don't have to give a lecture to you on royalty, I suppose. No, no, no. I am quite comfortable living where I am. I don't want to become a royalty. Man, Sanjay, you will become a royalty. No, 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 no. I am fine where I am. Hey, yeah. Royalty is Brahman. Living next to royalty is Brahmaloka. Staying in the suburbs of England is Indraloka. <laughs> Somewhere in the heart of London. Okay, you are, you are living in the, the most expensive penthouse in London is Indraloka. Right next to Buckingham Palace is Brahmaloka. Royalty is Brahman. Now you choose. Oh no sir, I am happy in the suburbs. Yeah, come on, go and get a glimpse of what it is to live on the 30th floor of a penthouse. A duplex spent on the 30th floor in the heart of city of London. That is only Indra Loka. Next to Brahma Loka is, next to Buckingham Palace is also is the most premium property. That's Brahma Loka. Getting right into Buckingham Palace as royalty is Brahman. Not only you, your generations to come are royalty. Raja Vidya. Raja Guhya Yoga. So one who has little ounce of wisdom, they would have heard of this royalty. It means one who has knowledge, they know this is the highest knowledge. There's, it's like a person, I have climbed all the mountains, but I have never heard of Mount Everest. What? I have played all the badminton tournaments, I have won all the uh, Yonex opens all over the world, but I've never heard of England open. All England. What? I have won all the tennis tournaments, but I've never heard of Wimbledon. Something wrong with you? Are you a tennis player? There is no tennis player who would not have heard of Wimbledon. In fact, I don't know whether you have had access to the beautiful farewell speech by Roger Federer. I will share with you, in fact, I will share with the group. Fascinating four-minute farewell speech by Roger Federer when he announces the time. Did you hear that? And he says how he thanked the, the Swiss Federation. He said, I, when I started, my exposure to tennis was, I was just a ball boy in one of the Swiss clubs. And I, I am grateful to the Swiss Tennis Association to have recognized my passion, given me the opportunity, and he is recognized as one of the greatest uh, sportsmen who played the game as a true gentleman. 
What a charisma he had. Having won over 20 Grand Slams. So if you are in tennis, you will obviously hear of Wimbledon. If you are a mountaineer, you will obviously hear of the king of all mountains, the Mount Everest. If you are a spiritual seeker, you will have to know about the highest, which is the goal of self-realization. Don't tell me I don't know. Something jarring. So that is not... If you have never heard, if you have never considered, that means you are Alpa Buddhi. He only wants to come out with... So the fact that you got an opportunity to sit in the hot seat, they call isn't it? The game, they call it a hot seat. To get an opportunity to sit in the hot seat itself is a... Some karma you almost have done. But to say, I only want a luxury car of $200,000 and I'll take and walk out. Chicken intellect you've got. God, there, try, man. Try for the jackpot. If you, if you can't jackpot, at least try. Go beyond that. Small people only think small. In fact, there's a saying, it's as easy to, to, be, to think big as it is to think small. It's very easy to think big as you are thinking small. But do you dare to think big? How lofty you can think, think talks about how grown you are within. Sanjay, it's not possible that a fellow would not have heard of royalty. He is Brahman. So write down that example. Indra Loka. Brahma Loka, Brahman. Okay? I just spoke in a language which perhaps will strike a chord. With no disrespect, please. Huh? Great. 27. Naite Shruti Partha Janan Yogi Muthyati Kashchana Tasmat Sarveshu Kaleshu Yoga Yukto Bhavarjuna Naite Shruti Partha Janan Yogi Muthyati Kashchana Tasmat Sarveshu Kaleshu Yoga Yukto Bhavarjuna. Knowing these two parts, Supartha, Arjuna, no yogi is deluded. Therefore, the smart Sarveshu Kaleshu at all times. Yoga Yuktaha. Be steadfast in yoga, Arjuna. Look at it. Then I see here Lord Krishna is telling, inspiring us to be steadfast. To seek nothing other than knowing the two parts. What are the two parts? The part of the sun, the path of the moon. Please see the path of the sun, man. Don't be content with the path of the moon. Don't lead that life of no upasana. Live a life with upasana. Seek the higher. So those who understand the two parts, he says, such a person is never deluded. If you still choose the path of the moon, means you're deluded. Isn't it? If you choose the path of the moon, you are deluded. Now what causes delusion? Ignorance is a general answer, generic answer. But specifically what causes delusion? See, you need to attune to the, the context and the text. I don't know how many of you are attuned to it. But it's, it's pure music to a, a true philosopher. If you're a true philosopher, if you're in the path, this means. Because it's just giving you what, which path to go, what to do, what not to do.
in fact you are you are spelling out what delusion is where you are deviating from vasana right but why is one deluded what causes delusion huh desire desire is the cause for delusion it clouds you you don't see anything beyond that then you will automatically fall into the path of return no therefore he says knowing these two parts a true yogi is not deluded and only when you are not deluded you become steadfast steadfast in your attempt to seek the self you would not encash your sadhana you don't encash it for yourself you just keep investing you keep plowing back everything into it for the highest you don't compromise very rare and this is a very very rare the rarest of all so it is the it's the desire that comes and spoils the the entire action now this action which i'm doing now it gets ruined if there is a malice of a desire or a motive so it's my attempt to make this action as pure as possible without even the blemish of desire so blemish no? even without a blemish of desire there is no motive at all so if i have to dig and i have to be very truly honest and brutally honest with myself what am i getting out of this why am i doing it what is this whole exercise for and i have to be brutally honest to myself and if i find that there is a even a residue or a blemish of desire finished it spoils it all it's like they say it's like a drop of lime in milk spoiled you can have 100 liters of pure buffalo cow milk but one drop of lime finished spoiled so the goal is not what you are doing the goal is to remove the the blemish of a desire in it no selfish thought no i no my and it's difficult for anyone to gauge or assess you because it takes a milton to understand a milton you must be somewhere at that level or beyond the level of a person to know what he is if you are below that person's level it's impossible to assess you don't have eyes to see you will put a motive to me because you are only operating with a motive like this morning i was telling someone is it person here person is here i was telling that person don't do it because others will attribute a motive to you some context you are pure i said to that person you are pure you don't have any motive you don't have axe to grind but they will only view as if you have an axe to grind so don't do it i said an impure person trying to assess a pure person is it possible sir an impure mind what will have an what will an impure mind do sir you only look at the world with only impure mind is it only negativity so the because we say the world is what's the law here ranga ji what's the law of its substantial what we are saying an impure mind only sees an impure world what's the law which supports this argument uk what's the law which supports it i'm tired of listening to ramji ma 
the world is a reflection of your uh, mind. The world is a reflection of your mind. Correct. The world is a projection or reflection of your mind. This is the law. You don't want. You don't have to change the world. You change the other day you posted, didn't you? You change the the source that perceives the world. What perceives the world is the mind, not the object. So you change the the mind. The world changes automatically. Changes automatically changes. So in order to understand a person who is selfless, you must be selfless first. Could you, sir, just for the benefit of those online, could you use the microphone, please? That's normally also we say, if your intentions are honest of doing a thing, don't worry about what others are thinking about. Correct. Just referring to your example a few minutes back, when if your mind is trying to attribute a motive to the other guy, why should I even bother let him do what he wants? Let him attribute. Why should it stop me from doing that as long as I know that my intentions are honest and I am doing it for the right place? Correct. You should not. No, no, but you told him that don't do it because he will attribute a motive. So I understood it that way. What you told a few minutes back. Oh. To an individual in the morning, that that impure mind will attribute a motive to whatever you are doing because he has got an agenda. So don't even pursue it. But I am only saying why should we not pursue it? As long as we have no, I can't get into the the detail of it. But uh, I I I I get where you're coming from. No, you don't have to change your course of action because you misunderstood. I, that was not the the line of suggestion. Because uh, it was not required to be done. Even though it, would have, it was a matter of fact, I said, don't bring it up. It was a matter of fact. I said, don't bring it up. If you had brought it objectively also, they will think you have an axe to grind. I said, best is, let it speak for itself. Whatever has to happen, let it happen. You be objective, you be a witness and see what is happening. Don't get involved and try to do things, even if you are doing it. So it's as simple as a guru in the a portion where it can be misunderstood, I'm saying. One of the qualities of a student. Lord Krishna says, is a student must serve the Guru. Guru Sevaya, he says. So the Guru is telling the student to serve him. Then you serve me first. For what? Before you receive the knowledge. So imagine when a Guru says a student to serve him. Why is the Guru telling the student to serve him? Because only when a student is a giver, he is an adhikari of this knowledge. Because this knowledge is only meant for sacrifices. This knowledge is not meant for non-sacrifices. If you are a non-giver, you are disqualified for this knowledge. So the guru ensures to make you be a giver. And how does it begin with, serve me first? And when a guru says that, true guru says that, he is very objective. He is no interest. There is nothing that you can give a guru. So he is above wants. A true guru. So if we take into account that a true guru is above desires and wants, he is saying and doing whatever it is for my own benefit. There is no question of misunderstanding the guru. But here is there a possibility. Ah, the guru might be having some acts to grant. That's the reason he is saying serve me. You get it? Context like that, innocent is true. I said, why are you making that statement? Don't make it. Let it be. Let you be quiet. It's 
true. So the two parts, the path of light and darkness. Be steadfast. The sad part is yoga yukta. He said the yoga yukta, be steadfast in yoga. Majority of gurus have misunderstood and they're practicing yoga physically. It's become an integral part of their, in fact, it's a USP. The USP of a spiritual institution is yoga, physical exercise. Be steadfast in yoga is not physical yoga. Be steadfast in yoga is to not to fall into these traps of blemish or desire. The owners of the guru is to clarify that. But today USP is our biggest spiritual institution, all if not all. No barring, no exception. In fact, a student and the day, someone acquainted to me went to a, I don't want to name that institution, went there with an intention to learn the spiritual knowledge, spent a month there, and he came back. He said, only being told to do the exterior of spirituality. Nobody is taking the interior. But what they have done is very well marketed. This morning, you came and told marketing, or no, marketing, or no. What is the one thing we are not doing is marketing. We need to do marketing. We need to make some noise. The world should know what we are offering. The empty vessels make a lot of noise. That's what he told me this. He gave me this. But empty vessels make a lot of noise. I didn't get a chance to meet the guru. And yet all what I did was only yoga and this and that and seva. And they, they told him to do uh, seva you mentioned. You know Cleaning the vessel, that, this, and all. Another institution, nothing to do with. Huh? But when he says no, but this context I'm saying can easily be interpreted to one's convenience. Following the thought flow, now you know what he means when he says be steadfast in yoga can easily be conveniently taken out of context and marketed. Remember, anything gross cannot control the subtle. The mind and the desires which cause delusion is subtle. Physical exercise is gross. It cannot control that. It cannot wipe off. How can it? It cannot. I will ask this fundamental question to any 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 spiritual guru out there and say, how can me merely doing physical exercises help me attain spiritual elevation? It cannot. It cannot eradicate my desires. It's a subtler realm. It has no access there. Yes, sir? He has that. No, you are, please use the mic. Yeah, yeah. Stop. There's an option between praying or playing football. You said play football. There is definitely a physical discipline also helps you. That's why the seva is given up. In fact, Manava Seva is called as Madhava Seva. Physically even exhausting yourself by doing Seva can definitely direct one towards the body. You know, That's the reason that Seva is given the primary thing. Even many great masters have said it to Seva. You don't have to be Sir, I am not challenging anything here. What I am, in fact, you quoted Vivekananda. The context was few people went up to Vivekananda and said, teach Vedanta. And in his curt answer to them was, he said, you first go play football and then come to me, I'll teach you. So the context, why he said that was, 
those who came to them to learn Vedanta were in a tamasic stage. And what you are seeking Vedantic knowledge is sattvic stage. You have to bypass Rajas to get to Sattva. So he said, you fellows must get into action, man. So he said, go play football to get out of Tamas into Rajas. And then Rajas, you get into Sattva. My usual question to Vengaji is, which stage? Remember? Yeah. No, no, remember our conversation earlier? Ah. He used to say, Guruji, I'm in Rajasic mode. I said, Rajasic Rajas or Sattvic Rajas? I said, inject some Sattva into Rajas. Pure Rajas is running behind the materialistic world. Sattvic Rajas is you are injecting the, the higher principles and value systems into your person. So you're not caught up in the the glamour of materiality in the world. It just becomes a means of serving a cause, seva. And then when sattvic, rajas becomes rajasic sattva. Then sattva is there. In the earlier stage, it is, it is sattvic rajas. Still rajas, but there's a flavour of sattva. Beyond that is Rajasic Sattva. It's Sattva but little Rajas. But then comes pure Sattva. Then comes Trans Sattva. All different terms saying the same thing. But Shivaji, the Seva, what you are speaking of is in a different mode. Like you are saying, if you physically exhaust yourself, you can still, I don't completely subscribe. We are taking an example of football. David Beckham is a great footballer. But does he have any of the characters of a nice individual, the way he you know, behaved himself? No, no, I'm just like, being physical and spiritual is completely a different context. Otherwise, most of the accomplished guys who have achieved heights and physical this thing, including, you know, big golfers and all, they would not have behaved the way they would have in a normal way. The other seva is a different one. Washing utensils, cleaning slippers, and you know all of that. That actually brings you to a much more grounded. Active. No, but be doing the physical seva. You are going to physically. You are going to go to utilize yourself. Physical seva is good. Physical seva. I am not disputing. I am talking about the other physical activity. Like it's it's one ball. aspect. Football is only it's a reference. I can take ball, I can take it all the Yeah. But if they are not going to be active physically, they are not going to be active in the game also. What will they become? Will you think do you think it's not physically fit? You would have played the highest level of football? No, no, but I'm really talking what Guruji was saying, spirituality and this physical fit. I don't think everybody who is physically active. It can be vice versa, but not the other way. You can cross. And by being physically active, by doing it, you have already realized a good portion of this, the sattva. And then you can straight away, you can, many of the rishis, Ramana Maharishi never do anything routine. No routines for him. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Once you cross, it, there is no need to do that. You need to be in the initial stages. It's all needed. Sir, have we not often maintain that a human being has got three aspects of his personality. There is a physical aspect, there is the emotional aspect, there is intellectual aspect. You have got a body, you have got a mind, you have intellect. Please understand that fundamentally. Because you have got a body, you have got physical exercise. Physical exercise is not building a muscle. Physical exercise is to do some physical action. You don't, you do physical action with the spirit of service. How can I be of service to others at the physical level? That is karma yoga. You have a mind to feel. Don't develop attachment to I and my, my family, my, my, my business, my this, my that. You develop an attachment to higher. That's bhakti yoga. Intellect, don't get caught up in the mundane transaction of the worldly knowledge. Differentiate between the real and unreal. So the intellect, when you think of the higher, is jnana yoga. 
so to the extent you have physical mental intellectual you will have to do all the three that is all they are saying if you are not fit for all the three you are put into hatha yoga ha ah, hatha yoga is for those who are not ready for karma bhakti gyanam and today hatha yoga has become the biggest spiritual path hatha is somebody must instruct and say bend as much as possible and touch your toes some fellow will come and push you also behind compulsion by your so will not bend but as you instruct you hatha compulsion i am not ridiculing here i am just being <coughs> what it is once you go beyond hatha comes the karma bhakti jnana then comes uparati then comes dharana dhyana then comes moksha we we'll take up <coughs> yes here in 28 and we we'll come back 28 weeks vedeshu yagneshu tapasu chaiva दानेशु यदुण्यफल प्रदिष्ट अत्येति तत्सर्वेद विदेवा योगी परम स्थानुपैति चाध्यम वेदेशु यु तपस्सु चानेशु यदुण्यफल प्रदिष्ट अत्येति अत्येतम विद्वा योगी परम स्थानुपैति चाध्यम वॉट एवर मेरीटोरियस फ्रूट इज असाइन टू वेदस सैक्रिफाइसेस ऑस्टेरिटीज एंड ऑल्सो द गिफ्ट द योगी rises of all these by having known and attains the primeval supreme abode so this verse the first half of the mantra the verse is talking about those who are involved in the spiritual practice as we use the word non yogis they are only as i have said who is a yogi sir yogi is one who doesn't in cash a non yogi in cash example ready karo we used it earlier a yogi in cash is a non yogi in cash is yogi doesn't in cash no yogi can be person of uh, unselfish or selfish yes uh so instead of putting it that way i'm just talking of example we took sir the millionaire example one who in cash is is He exits the game. He exits the game. Yeah. He just gets himself a, a luxury car and exits. He encashes. But one who doesn't encash is he wants to go for the jackpot, ultimate goal. ultimate goal. So here the verse is talking about those who seek this as an end in itself. so when you pursue something as an end in itself it is in cash we all following online if you use something as an end in itself and in cash it it is you are a non yogi a yogi is one who uses things as a means to an end 
He doesn't in cash. So whatever meritorious fruit is assigned to the Vedas, sacrifices, austerities, and gifts, the yogi rises above all. This means he doesn't entertain any motive when he performs the sacrifices, austerities. He is not interested in anything. He understands the limitation of entertaining a desire. There is no blemish of desire. They have to squeeze him out to find a desire or motive in them. There is no desire or motive in them. It's even difficult to conceive that stage, Ilya. Yeah? I was trying to visualize a person. How does he look and behave? <laughs> Who is in that stage? Are there any role models we can uh, aspire to? Don't ever make that mistake of creating a role, finding a role model. Yeah. No, but for us to even visualize how somebody in that stage will look like. How does it matter? How does it look like? Whether he wears a lion cloth or whether he wears a three-piece suit, how does it matter? No, not that way. Uh. I'm just saying that from a... How does he conduct himself? How does he actually deal with people? How does he actually deal with the world? How does he... So I mean, you must, I would strongly recommend you to read the <clears throat> second chapter of the Gita, verses 54 to 72. He talks of Asthita Prajna, who is a man of perfection. I'm sure you would have read that section. That section, he paints a picture who is a, who is a perfect soul. Asthita Prajna se kabhasha, samadhistasya keshava, sthitati kim prabhasheta kim asita kim rajeta kim. He asks four questions. How does he sit? How does he walk? How does he talk? And what does he do when he is within himself? So what is happening to him when he is contacting the world? What is happening with him when he is within himself? How does he conduct himself in the world? You need, <clears throat> you need to have the eyes to see that. And he gives a quality, what is the characteristic of a person, such as a person. And once you imbibe those characteristics, relate to the characteristics, you will have the lens to, through which you can see. Now you're asking, how does he, how does a man of that stature behave? Or how, how is he? What is he? But you must know how to evaluate. So the 18th chapter gives you the ways how to not evaluate, how to reach that state. Because the study is not to find out who is perfect. The study is to reach that state of perfection. Once you reach that state, you know who is reached, who is not reached. The trouble is that everybody thinks that he has reached <laughs> that state. Because they don't know what it is actually. You know, they all think that in their immature uh, understanding of that state. What are, you know, you, you have explained that uh, those four stages here. Yes. So even if you are in the first, <laughs> you will think that you are in the third. So that's where actually the confusion comes. That's the reason you are told to practice Upasana. When you are practicing Upasana means when you are with the Guru, you are able to gain that insight. There is that opportunity to get the inner inner feel. You you is you know it's like 
there are very few students even now who come up and open their themselves completely to me and which is what happened this morning somebody came to me and that person was in a predicament and a dilemma and that person opened up so there is no inhibition open up everything and put to the guru and help you analyze that is when you gain clarity but when there is ego then you don't surrender i know mujhe pata hai that inhibition that's the difference between devotion and surrender all of you are devoted but have you surrendered you should whomever you surrender whoever your guru is you could surrender then you can help. so that is when that inner perception is gain but that is difficult to gain with bookish knowledge that you can but to practice that quality of understanding that the desire is that which is going to create not only in a spiritual field any field so you are a ceo of a company if you entertain a motive when sitting that seat is it not going to you going to stagnate there is it not going to bring you down fall wherever it is you are expected to do that selflessly serve the cause exactly the same thing i told this morning also to the class you just do your job be completely detached to it and do what you expected to do that's all you're not even a trustee until you're being entrusted to do it so till then you be detached Getting what? No, you have nothing to do with it. So the exercise we all have to do is: Am I entertaining any motive while I'm doing whatever I'm doing? What are you doing? What is your motive? If there is a motive, your attempt should be to purify, it. get rid of selfishness, and get on to unselfishness. And where there is unselfishness, let's say you're sixty percent unselfish, there's still forty percent selfishness. No. work on that so that as you keep working on removing and purifying the motive that you know to you when you do self assessment you would know like as i am saying as i am teaching this knowledge what is the motive i am behind this knowledge what is the motive behind this effort of mine what is it that brings me with passion whether there are audience or no audience whether there whether uh, there is no guarantee but what is it that drives me to to teach this knowledge is there a motive if there is a motive what is the motive i got to ask myself hmm? oh, clean is just keep cleaning all the <laughs> but to understand that the desire is the evil man minus desire is equal to god yes upar agar guru ji when we are talking about uh, the people who are uh, pursuing the path of brahman and almost reaching the brahman how they look or how you know when we look at our puranas mahabharat they are different people in different forms and in different uh, walks of life they have attained attained brahman for example You see, Bhishma, he had a different attitude, and he attained Brahman. And Dronacharya, which I was listening today morning, he attained Brahman. That's what. Sorry, you met Dronacharya. I was listening to him, sir. Huh? I was listening to his uh, talk. talk. So he attained huh? Brahman. So they are looking. They had a different uh, way of life, but still they attained, which was very surprising. I I never knew, and uh, he is called Yoga Purusha, Dronacharya, which I was not knowing. because i thought he selfish you know having uh, uh, cutting the thumb of thumb of uh, you know ekalavya and all but when i was looking into you know somebody trying to explain it was really you know i would so as a normal human being i will not understand the intricacies and what who or what a person is 
I might be meeting uh, realized souls. Who knows? But you I may not know that. You can be amidst a realized soul or a highly evolved soul. You will have no clue. Because a thumb rule is a truly realized soul will never claim to be realized. If a fellow is claiming himself to be realized, it's a gimmick. He is having a very deep hidden motive. Serious motive he has got. And one who, one who is one who is telling this is not realized. Thumb rule. In fact, one of my students in Malaysia, yeah, you know, if he listens to he can listens to my lectures. And the other day he messaged me again of a guru. I don't want to mention I have nothing against him. And he gets very emotional. This he, he is claiming himself to be realized, and his devotees also are propagating that he's realized. I my blood is boiling because I know the truth. What is your problem? Now, why are you getting excited about whether he claims to be realized or not? His chelas are claim, uh, all fanning him. Let them do. It is as much his birthright to realize as much your birthright. Why don't you also attain realization? Got the point, sir. Conversation ended there. Why are you worried? But you would not have a clue. The last point I would mind to make, sir. Never follow a role model. Mistake we do is what we are told never to follow the lifestyle of a guru. Only go by the teachings. Because all men who attained that state of realization, they had followed their constitution which was true to them. So you can attain moksha by following the constitution which is unique to you. And how that is uniqueness is not my personality nor his personality. So you got to understand your nature, be true to it and embark on it. And it is. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Now the last section of the, the text. To conclude. Om Tat Sat Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita Tsupanishad Su Brahma Vidhyayam Yoga Shastre Shri Krishna Arjuna Samvade Akshara Brahma Yogo Nama Ashtamodhyaya As tradition calls, we'll chant the first verse together, please, once. Arjuna Uvacha Kim Tat Brahma Kim Adhyatmam Kim Karma Purushottama Adhibhutam Cha Kim Proktam Adhidaivam Kim Ucchate We chant the first verse just to humbly remind ourselves that it's not the end, but it's a humble beginning again. Okay, so we conclude the class with the shanti. Oh, oh, Namada, oh, Namidam, oh, Nan. Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Namaha Hari Om